welcome. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Um, Josh Ring, my co-chair, and I from University of Oregon are delighted to see all of you here. And we're very excited about today's special union session. Um, the idea for this came about, about a year ago as we began planning for the AGU Centennial events with their 100th year next beginning, the kickoff now, and next year is the Centennial. And remarkably, 100 years ago, one of the greatest scientists in the field of Earth surface processes, geomorphology, passed away in 1918, Grove Carr Gilbert, um, a fantastic, amazing geologist, geographer, and explorer of the 19th to 20th century with a long um, career and an amazingly impactful legacy. So in, in today's session, Josh and I have assembled four invited talks to focus on the broad scientific legacy of Grove Carr Gilbert and the new frontiers of study in Earth and planetary processes. His 75-year life spanned the age of heroic geology, and he was happiest in the field. But he also did important work with modeling, both physical and conceptual. He helped to formalize the Earth's surface system, and a century after his death, the Earth and planetary science communities remain engaged on topics first broached by his curious mind. And I would say the same for the four speakers we have today. Um, we see an amazing legacy coming from them as well. His ideas and data continue to steer research um, he's extensively cited. Josh told me recently that during his own PhD work, every member of the lab group at UC Berkeley could point to a sentence or two in Gilbert's classic professional paper on the Henry Mountains, the geology of the Henry Mountains, that foretold the essence of their dissertation research. And we think this continues today. So I'm going to turn it over to, to Josh to introduce our first speaker, but I also want to point out that today we have a virtual online audience as well as the physical, physically present audience we have here. And they also can submit questions, so we'll every now and then um, turn to them during the question sessions. Thank you. All right, Bob Anderson is going to kick it off and he's going to tell us reflections on the legacy of Grove Carl Gilbert, known to his friends as Carl. Thanks, Bob. Good morning. Uh, please forgive me uh, in that we can't get the presentation mode to work here in which all of my words are uh, available. So I'm going to be just winging it here. Um, so reflections on the legacy of Grove Carl Gilbert. He was born in 1843, lived for five days shy of 75 years. He was a geographer, a geologist, an explorer. He was not a professor, and therefore his legacy is not one of a, a set of students who then pass on his word. His legacy is entirely in his writings, and I would claim that his writings are particularly clear. I'll try to illustrate that over the course of this, of this um, presentation. So how do I go forward? In this first photograph of G.K. Gilbert, we see him in, at age 19, uh, the Civil War is raging. He's still in, at the University of Rochester, where he, uh, very close to where he grew up. Uh, he then moves on to uh, working with the Ward Scientific Collections uh, agency or company, uh, most famously reconstructed an entire mastodon from this particular work in the 60s. He then, by the late 60s, uh, sort of gets the itch to move on from that kind of collection and go back to the math and science and natural history that, that um, he, he took in, at the University of um, Rochester. And he, he became apprenticed to John Strong Newberry, who was then the head of the uh, Ohio Geological Survey. Uh, oh, hang on. Let me, oops. Yeah, well, let me take a moment to uh, describe three biographies from which I am borrowing shamelessly. The first is from William Morris Davis, published in 1927, is required that if a National Academy of Science member dies, another National Academy of Science member writes a biography. So that's William Morris Davis. Half a century later, um, Stephen Jay, Gould, Stephen Jay uh, Pine writes uh, what is the most authoritative biography of Gilbert to date. And then, interestingly, four years later, the official 
um, historian of the USGS, Harold Burstein, writes what could effectively be considered an extended abstract of his life in an open file report that I highly recommend. By 1869, the railroad was completed across the United States and that railroad becomes a jumping off point for the surveys that are subsequently to carry out the investigation of the Western United States. You can also see in this photograph of, of, the, of the driving of the Golden Spike that photography had matured over the course of the Civil War, which by now has ended. The four surveys of the West were uh, Clarence, uh, by, by these very interesting and uh, charismatic individuals, uh, all different in their own right. Clarence King is, uh, uh, runs the geological exploration of the 40th parallel, essentially parallel to the railroad. Uh, John Wesley Powell is uh, running the U.S. Geographical and Geological Survey of the Rocky Mountain region, essentially the Colorado Plateau and, and surrounds. Ferdinand Hayden is uh, running the USGS, U United States Geographic, Geological Survey of Montana and adjacent territories. He effectively opens up Colorado and Wyoming and most famously embeds uh, photographers and artists in his expeditions. Uh, the, those photographs and paintings opened up Yellowstone as, our, as the um, uh, first national park. But it was to Lieutenant George Montague Wheeler that uh, Gilbert was attached. Wheeler ran his explorations west of the 100th Meridian in very much a military fashion. It was the one of these surveys that was, in fact, a military. Uh, and here's a painting of, of Wheeler much later in his life. And you can see in 1871 and 72, when Gilbert was, was with Wheeler on his surveys, the path that they took across the United States, over the western United States, from Death Valley all the way across what is now U uh, Utah and Nevada. They went, uh, they lined their boats up the Colorado River extensively. And in the next few photographs, I'm gonna show you um, photographs that are easily available from the archives from, from uh, Wheeler survey. Uh, these are photographs of Tim Bell, um, and again, these are easily downloadable, something, that, a, a joy of living when we do live. These are archived right down the street here. These surveys were carried out on horseback and mule with wagons carrying the loads of supplies. They had a retinue of hunters and scouts uh, and assistants. I love the photograph on the left here. The guy on the right in that photograph is carrying a bugle on his back. Presumably that's like the whistle that we now carry. Um, the scientists embedded in the Wheeler survey were uh, always a, a little bit unhappy. It was a very rapid pace, as you could see, 2,000 miles in the course of a summer. Um, they were also, it also graded on them that they were subordinate to the, the officers of the, of the Army. And in the winter, here, here they are in their furthest up, upstream boat. This was the boat called the Trilobite, and I believe Gilbert is the one in the back. Although they all have beards, it's a little bit difficult to tell who's who. <laughs> um, finally, uh, in the winters, they were frustrated, the scientists were, by not being able to publish or, uh, in, in reputable journals. So it was in that, um, with that perspective that that G.K. Gilbert decided to bolt from the Wheeler survey and join the Powell survey. He spent the next winters, couple winters, writing up his work for the Wheeler survey, but then in 1875 goes to join the Powell survey in the field. And in that field work, which went through the late 1870s, this trio of scientists um, developed a deep, deep uh, collaboration and uh, comradeship. Uh, C.E. Dutton, Clarence Edward Dutton on the left, Major Powell on the right, he's lost his right arm in the Battle of Shiloh in Civil War, and G.K. Gilbert in the front. And it was uh, commonly said, certainly in Dutton's writing, that it was very difficult to tell who actually came up with the ideas around the campfires. Their first publication together was this 
1878 Arid Regions Report, as it came to be known. And it is in, the, in this report that Powell essentially argues that um, the West should be settled with an eye toward where the water is. And I highly recommend reading Wallace Stegner's book, the Beyond the 100th Meridian, as an introduction to Powell's life and, and his, uh, his journey down the, the Colorado River in 1869, and subsequently his career, attempting to essentially be an activist for the development of the West in a rational, hydrolo hydrologically rational way. Gilbert's contribution to this Arid Regions Report which I, I reread his chapters over the weekend is just lovely. He is uh, he's laboring under uh, or is being tasked with the the um, trying to understand the statement that was commonly around in the 1860s that the rain follows the plow. And in this in this water supply chapter, he says, okay, well, the farmers tell us that the rain follows the plow. In other words, as soon as you cultivate the land, it begins to, to uh, rain more, and the streams flow more. And indeed, one can see uh, uh, what, what Gilbert essentially says is, okay, fine, we, we got all these farmers sort of anecdotes. Well, we have data, and the data is in the form of the lake level of uh, the Great Salt Lake, shown in the lower left, which has an annual cycle, and then a secular trend over the 60s, showing increase in water level, and then an expansion of the lake from its original map by Stansbury in 1850 to its 1870 manifestation with 17% enlargement. What Gilbert says, look, this is a closed basin. It rains as inputs, it rains on the land, the, land, the water runs off across the land into the lake, it directly rains on the lake, and then the losses are only evaporation, or what he called absorption into the atmosphere. And, and uh, when it rains more than it, than it evaporates, you get water, you, you get a rise of the water level in the lake and the opposite in the, in the middle of the summer and in the fall. But what, essentially what, pardon me, what Gilbert has done is he's, he's used, although he didn't write it in math, He's used the principle of conservation of water, which we now easily translate into mathematical symbols. The rate of change of the volume of the water of the lake is equal to the gains minus the losses. And this organizing principle of conservation of something, here water, is something we see reflected in 40 years of subsequent uh, writings by Gilbert. Okay, so he's out there in the 1870s with Powell. Uh, his first task assigned in 1876 is to study the Henry Mountains, and that's these, these mountains shown in the yellow circle and shown in more detail here. They're a forested set of mountains. They get up to 11,000, 12,000 feet and are significantly different in color because they have a forest on them and, in contrast, the red rocks of the, of the Mesozoic pile in the, in the uh, Colorado Plateau. And this is a view shown from the uh, top of North Caneville Plateau showing the sort of uh, erosion of the flat-lying Mesozoic pile in the foreground, including the shales and the for, uh, uh, what Gilbert called the Blue, Blue Gate uh, Shale. And then in the, in the far field, the warped up sedimentary structure of the, of the um, Henry Mountains. And this frontispiece to his work, a work of art in itself, shows the two themes that he will, uh, that they'll occupy him over the course of this, his report. In the back half, you see the warping of the Mesozoic pile due to the intrusion of, of uh, the Henry Mountains intrusives that warps up the pile. In the foreground, you see the subsequent erosion of the landscape that reveals the modern topography with its steep, boulder-strewn streams draping the intrusives and the, the shallow slopes and low stream, stream grades uh, in, the, um, uh, in the shales in the foreground. And one can see in this another thing you should read, uh, this uh, essentially an annotated version of Gilbert's notes, um, one can see the evolution of his thoughts in his notebooks, which are beautifully reproduced here. And as an aside, let me also note that not only are these notebooks available at the National Archives down the street, 
So also are something called letterpress books. So these are an early version of Xeroxing, where one writes, let's say in fountain pen, in your tent, a letter to, say, Powell, who's back in, in DC. And uh, before the ink dries, you, you uh, blot it out with a piece of tissue paper. And that tissue paper is bound into a book of tissue paper that's like 500 pages thick. And these bound books of letterpress books, as they're called, are available for your viewing pleasure. And, and they really are quite illuminating in terms of original source of how these, these people thought uh, while they're in the field. So this, the most famous chapter of, of this book is, uh, for the geomorphic community anyway, is chapter five, Landscapes, Land Sculpture. In this, he says, and I'll read just a couple uh, sentences, the sculpture and degradation of land are performed by shore waves, partly by glaciers, partly by wind, but chiefly by rain and running water. The last mentioned agencies only will be here described. The erosion which they accomplish will be considered A, as consisting of parts, and B, as modified by condition. By parts, he means processes. By conditions, he means the climatic forcing of those processes. He goes on to describe these systems, the geomorphic system that, that gives rise to the landscape sculpture, um, in ways that I've sort of abstracted here in the top, essentially a set of, of conveyors. He's talking about the hill slope conveyor. Is there a pointer? We don't, never mind. Oh, here we go. Great. All right, so in this top plot, we see a conveyor belt that's being loaded from the bottom. In this case, it would be weathering of material from, from bedrock here that's loaded onto the conveyor. The conveyor is the hill slope. The soil moves down the slope from left to right here and is dumped into the nearby river and thereby linking the hill slopes and the rivers in the topographic system. And all of the processes and all of the, the uh, climatic forcing of those processes and the dependence upon a bedrock are well illuminated in his, in his work. Subsequently, he, he continued to do research in, in the um, Bonneville Basin, shown here in a box. The whole right-hand side, or eastern side of the Great Basin, drains locally into a, a, a basin, into a closed basin that is Lake Bonneville. And in, in the Lake Bonneville report, which is ultimately published in 1890, he essentially gives birth to, to uh, coastal geomorphology, ironically in an arid interior continental region, where he describes uh, shorelines, always in these cases a Bonneville shoreline, he dubbed it as the highest, 100 meters lower than that, the Provo shoreline, and below that, something we subsequently call the Gilbert shoreline. But always this sort of uh, uh, barcode of Bonneville, Provo, and lower. His sketches are wonderful, um, and, and he, he was also documenting the elevations of all these shorelines uh, with using a barometer on his horse. Somebody back in Provo is told to monitor the barometer back in Provo to take, it's ultimately take out the climatic signal or weather signal. The most famous illustration from this work is shown here on left. It's plate 50. Of the, of the first monograph of the USGS. And you can see that the contours of the elevations of those shorelines are bowed up such that those around islands in the lake, the ranges of the Basin and Range province, are higher by 150 feet or 50 meters than they are at the edges of the basin. And he argued that this required that there be a fluid-like uh, motion of the interior of the earth. And I've simply diagrammed this on the right here where you have an empty lake basin with its, with its basin and ranges, its, its ranges separated by basins. That fills here, that acts as a load that drives upper mantle flow driven by a pressure gradient. The shorelines develop at that point on a loaded deflected crust and then that the lake goes away. It goes away catastrophically by 100 meters during the fall of a flood and then subsequently climatically and the return of the mantle warps up those originally flat shorelines. This has been used subsequently to document that, that 
uh, once we had a pacing from knowledge of what the lake level history looked like from C14, we can use that pacing and the, and the deflection to, to uh, constrain the viscosity of the mantle. And this same process of using geomorphic features that are warped um, uh, as a geophysical tool as, has, um, ha has been used for 100 years. Uh, and it's given birth to what we now call GIA, or, gl or glacial isostatic adjustment, which is global in scale. Here is the rebound associated with taking off the ice loads in the northern hemisphere. And here, more, more subtly, just rescaled, you can see even the reloading of the oceans giving rise to these sort of uh, eyeliners around every continent. That was the 1880s. Uh, excuse me, in, in eight, the 1880s, he's basically doing mostly administrative work with John Wesley Powell. John Wesley Powell is forced out of office, has to resign, resign in 1894. Um, and subsequently in the 1890s, uh, Gilbert goes back to work in the field. But the, his productivity is relatively low in the 90s. His wife has been sick and ultimately dies after 20 years of illness. And in 1899, um, Gilbert becomes embedded in a, an expedition uh, called the Harriman Expedition. We read about it in this wonderful book by Gutzman and Sloan. Harriman is the head of the, the, um, both the Southern Pacific and Union Railroads, very rich, has a family, um, a number of daughters, and he says, look, I, I need some scientists to go along on this trip. So he takes 20 scientists along, best in the nation, uh, and they, they all get in this, this boat, the SS George Elder, and head to Alaska. And here's Gilbert in the, in the foreground. I think it's not a coincidence. He's down on the ground with the kids and in the middle of the photograph. This is where they went. They went all the way up the coast of Alaska and all the way around the corner into the Bering Straits. And what Gilbert's doing is he's looking at the glaciers. And he's using photography to document the glaciers and where they are at that point in time. His contribution to the, the aftermath of the, the um, expedition is uh, very well known and probably the, the strongest of the contributions of that expedition. He then comes back and begins to split his time between uh, California, in particular Berkeley, and, uh, and DC, living with families uh, who have children. In particular, he, he also has becomes uh, a leader of expeditions to the Sierras, the deglaciated landscape. And here he's, he's known among his friends as Charlemagne. He's a tall guy, he's redheaded, and an even disposition. Let me... Um, uh, he, he also argues, and I'm going to, uh, I don't have a whole lot of time left, but he's going to argue here in this particular piece of writing, he's going to argue that we should all be taking pictures of, of uh, these glaciers. Use those cameras, you Sierra Club people, and document where they are. Take pictures from all kinds of vantage points, and we will have a record, therefore, of their change. And we can go to spots that G.K. Gilbert stood on and told other people to stand on subsequently. Here is his photograph from 1901 and a photograph taken 110 years later of showing the demise of the Lyell Glacier and the tip of the Yosemite National Park. But let me read this to you. I, I mean, this is uh, spectacular. It comes from that tiny little bulletin thing, and so it's, a, it's very clear writing. It is easy to get some inkling of the cause of these changes if we consider the essential nature of a glacier. It originates in a mountain valley where the accumulation of winter snow is greater than the summer heat can dissipate. The excess of snow piles up year after year, is compacted into ice, and creeps down the slope, constituting a slow but continuous stream of ice. As it de descends, it meets new climatic conditions, the winter snow becoming gradually less and the summer melting gradually greater until at length a region is reached where there is an annual loss of material instead of an annual gain, so the ablation area. 
In that region, it wastes away and comes to an end, so long as there is a balance at the lower end between the supply through forward motion and the loss through, through melting, or more strictly, melting and evaporation, the end of the glacier is constant in position. But whenever one of these factors overpowers the other, the glacier either grows longer when it is set to advance or grows shorter when it is said to retreat. I mean, you just can't be clearer than that. And it's, really easy to translate that into mathematical models and ultimately numerical models, and that's the hinge point for all of our numerical modeling. Gilbert is in California when the 1906 earthquake occurs, and it is during his report from that um, uh, earthquake, in the aftermath of that earthquake, that we begin to see Alice Eastwood in his photographs. Alice Eastwood is then a companion of his for the next 12 years. She was uh, renowned in her own right for having rescued, she's a botanist, and she rescued from the California Academy of Sciences the type specimens that were all so important in the aftermath of the quake as the fires raged and ultimately consumed this building. She rescued these plants. So she's a continuous companion over the next years. Uh, I'll trot out the 1909 paper called Convexity of, of Hilltops. Um, again, here's Gilbert's simple sketch, and the words wrapped around that can easily be translated into a mathematical statement here of conservation of soil, where one needs to know what the rate of soil production, or W, is. It comes in, to produces soil from weathering of bedrock, and we need to have rules for how that material moves down slope, the cues. Again, those are the backbone on which we build mathematical and numerical models. Subsequently, I'm gonna end here on, these, uh, on this last point because uh, I have two people who are gonna follow me in talks. Gilbert uh, is tasked with trying to understand in his last decade of his life, the aftermath of the slug of sediment that is put into the Sacramento River by this process of hydraulic mining of the auriferous gold bearing gravels. Again, I'm gonna leave that to Alan James and Bill Dietrich's talks for you to, to um, enjoy. Last slide, Gilbert's legacy. I focused on his scientific legacy and the, uh, the honors and awards abound both from the US and across the pond in Europe. But there's a leadership legacy as well. Not only was he the chief geologist for the USGS for a decade under Powell, but he was twice the GSA president. Um, in the closing lines of, of William Morris Davis's preface to G.K. Gilbert's biography, he states, his career covers a remarkable epoch in American science and is a great credit to American science that it should have given high rank to a man of, this gentle, of his gentle personality. It's therefore no wonder that we name awards in his honor, both within the geomorphic community and the geographic community. Although scientific instruments and, and institutions have changed dramatically since Gilbert's time, we are in many ways still pursuing questions for which he laid the foundations in his pioneering work. We may have new tools, but Gilbert clearly organized how the elements of the landscape link and compactly laid out the physics of many of the problems on which we still labor. At this time of unprecedented disregard for science, truth, and civility in public discourse, the record of Gilbert's life and work remains a touchstone of modern scientists. We should do science as Gilbert did, and we should behave as scientists and as citizens of the planet as Gilbert did. Thank you. We have time for questions. Yeah. Going back to your comment That's, that's a great question, Kelly. Um, oh, so um, 
Gilbert's, in, in Gilbert's um, study of the Great Salt Lake and the notion of rain follows the plow, how did he ultimately come down, especially in the, in, in the uh, face of the fact that Powell argued for development um, of the West only after we know how the water works out there. Um, in, interestingly, in rereading Gilbert's um, chapter, he is equivocal. He says, look, you know, the data could, there's a correlation between the population and cultivation of that region and the increase of the lake uh, level and area. Um, he argues that it could well be climate and that the climate is, could well be in the midst of a, of a positive side of an oscillation in climate, but that the record was not long enough to rule out the possibility of that secular change being due to cultivation. He did not, he, he argued on the other hand that we know what the physics is of, of the connection between the climate forcing and the lake level. We don't know the connection between cultivation and, and the lake level and, and the increase of precipitation. So, but it's still at, left at the level of, of uh, correlation. It was interesting that he didn't just slam the, the uh, rain follows the plow idea. He, he was very honest in his writing. said, look, we just don't have enough data to punch a hole in that. Powell, as you note, then argues, no, we have to be very cautious about um, pop populating the West and settling the West, and argued for a uh, waiting until a full irrigation survey had been accomplished over the 1880s. And that's what Dutton ultimately did in the 1880s, was run an irrigation survey of the West uh, as a precursor to development. And it was ultimately in the pressure of, of the of the citizens wanting to, to get out there and settle the West that, that the senators caved in and said, okay, Powell, you're out of here. That story is very well told in Beyond the 100th Meridian. Other okay, questions? I, I, um, I think we're gonna move on to the next talk, but let's thank Bob again. Uh, two notes, you do have an opportunity to ask questions with this app and also when you do ask a question for the next set of speakers please use the microphone so maybe after when we move to question period uh, line up behind that microphone in the center aisle um, because this is being streamed and so we want to we want to get it capture everything okay. PC or Mac yeah. PC Let me start by thanking Dorothy and Josh for organizing this session and for inviting me uh, to give me this opportunity to uh, really talk about one of my favorite scientists and one of my favorite monographs, uh, G.K. Gilbert and the Hydraulic Mining Sediment in the Sierra Nevada, Professional Paper 105. <laughs> this is Alan James. <laughs> He's going to talk to us about hydraulic mine. I would never want to not give the opportunity to introduce you, Alan. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> Thanks again. <laughs> but this um, monograph is one of my favorites, and, and these have been guiding beacons in my entire professional career. Uh, it's entirely appropriate that we look at this particular monograph during this centennial of the AGU and this centennial tribute to Gilbert. Because essentially this, uh, as, as Bob Anderson, I also want to thank Bob for this beautiful introduction, which makes my job a lot easier. You now have an overview of the, the incredible career of Gilbert. But um, this monograph was written one year before his death. So we, we celebrated the centennial of this monograph last year and we published a special issue in geomorphology dedicated to anthropogenic sediment. So this is all the better, and it seems that it's also appropriate that 
Gilbert had a connection to Washington, D.C. and a connection to California, Berkeley. And we have the Gilbert Club in Berkeley, and we have the AGU in San Francisco all these years. So this is a good time to have the centennial, and this kind of belongs there. Uh, hydraulic mining sediment was a new phenomenon. The, it was invented in California in 1853. It's not to be confused with ground sluicing. This is use of water under pressure with water cannons and later in conjunction with blasting. So this was extremely effective as a geomorphic agent. And by 1884, when it was enjoined by a federal court for environmental reasons, they had produced over a billion cubic meters of sediment. So the valley bottoms were just devastated. The farmers down in the Sacramento Valley were devastated. And this became the political issue of its day in the Sacramento Valley. Uh, Robert Kelly has written some good books on this, Gold versus Grain, back in the 1950s. And then in the 1980s, he wrote Battling the Inland Sea. The public perception was that hydraulic mining had caused the flooding. Well, Gilbert shows us that it was a lot more complicated than that. The Central Valley of California was prone to flooding already, but hydraulic mining sediment causing massive aggradation of the channels didn't help. It really exacerbated that problem. So you have a problem that's studied very intensely from the 1860s on, and there's no resolution of it, and there's still acrimony and bitterness and political issues, so they send Gilbert. Gilbert is asked to clarify the scientific principles and try to come up with an understanding of this giant wave of sediment. He's sent from the USGS, a federal agency, because the, the federal government has jurisdiction over navigable waters. So Gilbert's interest begins in the bay and it moves upward from there. Uh, he's, he starts with a, some fairly elaborate studies of coastal processes, coastal geomorphology, tidal prisms, uh, the Golden Gate Bar, and, and various other things that I'm going to sort of skip over because I'm going to go where my sweet spot is, which is the fluvial sediments that are generated by the mines, which he, he gets to and he really spends a lot of time on that. Now, Gilbert is about 62 or 63 years old when he undertakes the beginning of this project, and he spends 12 years on this project. There's a few uh, interruptions in that. When he first starts, there's the San Francisco earthquake, and so he takes some time off for that, and uh, Bob has shown us those wonderful photographs from the San Francisco earthquake. Then he gets, he has a stroke. Uh, I think it's about 1908 or 1909, and that delays his work for a couple years. When he recovers from that, he, he publishes his other famous monograph on hydraulic mining sediment, Transport of Debris by Running Water, which Bill Dietrich is going to talk about in a little bit. Um, that frees him up to concentrate on the big picture for the hydraulic mining in the Sierra Nevada monograph. Normally, Gilbert likes to look at, in his Lake Bonneville monograph and his Henry Mountains monograph, he would go in and out of scale. He would look at little microprocesses of sand grains moving and how that would explain the large scale features. He'd go from these meso and micro scale processes up to the macro scale. He didn't really do that as much in hydraulic mining sediment in the Sierra Nevada because he had written this wonderful treatise on the forces and energies and slopes and mechanics of flow of, and grain transport in the transport of debris by running water. That was behind him and so he concentrated on the large scale. This makes this monograph somewhat unique. Now I call this a capstone of his work not to say that it's the best, it would be a fool's game to try to compare his monographs and pick which one's better than that. Uh, they're all great. They're all interesting and they're all very different. And I'm gonna argue that this one is even more different than most of them. It's, it's quite a bit different for a number of reasons. But it's a capstone in that it, it's the end of his career. It's capping off this brilliant career uh, 
It's building upon a complex mass of information and knowledge and wisdom that he's accrued over, the, over his career. And then it's, a, it's an entirely transitional piece of work. This is Gilbert going beyond the era, that, <laughs> the era of geologic exploration. This launches Gilbert into environmental geology. This, I, will, I would say that this is the first, the world's first environmental impact statement. This monograph, he takes a stand on soil erosion. He, he, he looks at the long term as, no, as only he can do. And he sees that the mining sediment deliveries are decreasing. The production had already peaked and soil erosion was already more, producing more sediment than mines. And that the future problem was going to be one of soil conservation. So this is something that I'll bring up a little bit more in a minute, but uh, if this is an entirely different monograph than his other stuff. Again, it's a scientific monograph. It's not a policy paper. I don't want to make that, that claim. So there's a couple very uh, important distinctions of here. That first of all, I'll, I, I'm going to talk about the nature of the problem that he was he was entering, uh, this contentious problem. But later I'll come back to this anthropogenic change, which is another another major difference. Um, I mentioned that this was the political issue of its day, and river engineers had been studying the Sacramento Valley and the hydraulic mining sediment for decades before Gilbert arrived. There were congressional reports. These were not usually by geologists, they were by engineers. They were competent, they were rich in data, but they lacked Gilbert's perception of geologic time and the kind of scales that we're working on with the Sacramento River and the Sacramento Valley. So it's quite a different kind of, of task Gilbert ent enters this after his work on the uh, Wheeler and the Powell surveys and the Lake Bonneville, areas that are somewhat remote, areas that had not been studied that much, and he jumps into this politically charged arena with a whole lot of data, and he's asked to make sense of all this. And he does an admirable job because he does not get involved in the politi political or economic uh, issues. He, he jumps right to the science, he analyzes the data, and he does field work. So his methodology, as Vic Baker will point out in the next talk, Gilbert liked to derive his theories from observing nature. Rather than deriving his theories deductively, he liked to go out in the field and see what the field told him. And I think this is good advice for budding young scientists in the audience. It leads to a place-based sort of approach to some extent, but it will prevent a lot of blunders. Um, Gilbert's empiricism in this way got him into some trouble. Uh, William Ellis, the former mayor of Mar uh, Marysville and the levy commissioner, very knowledgeable about the mining sediment, Ellis described Professor Gilbert as wanting to go up to see the mines. Naturally, you've got to go do, do your field work, right? So, but they cautioned him that it was dangerous. He kind of laughed this off, but he admitted later to Ellis that some surly miner had held him at gunpoint and run him off the mine. So there really was a, a price to the field work and the empirical approach that he took, but he did do that. He also, as he did with many of his reports, he, he used the available data, historical data, instrumental data, whatever he could get his hands on. And then finally, he never shied away from multidisciplinary approaches. Uh, he took on the coastal geomorphology. He, he was addressing tectonic issues of subsidence in the bay. He was not shy. Uh, his use of a camera was wonderful, in my opinion. The photographs he took of the contemporary dams in the area are the only ones I know of. Well, there's a few others, 
In fact, I have a couple here on the bottom layer. There's a couple, but these two top ones show a beautiful view of a brush dam and a crib dam. These were required for hydraulic mining after 1884. Beginning in 1895, there was a period of licensed mining, which didn't produce much sediment, but it generated a lot of these little crib dams and brush dams. Gilbert recognized that these were ephemeral structures, that they would not last. Then, and he has a picture on the right there of uh, one breaching. And he describes them, I'll let you read it, but he describes them as ephemeral structures and, and that ultimately this sediment would come down. The policy towards these small little crib dams and brush dams changed about this time. And subsequently they, they shifted to requiring more massive concrete and masonry dams. Uh, some of those are still there. He also has photographs of the rivers at that time, which are priceless because they're very hard to find. What the conditions of the rivers were some 20 years after mining stopped. And it's not surprising to me anyway to see that the, uh, I do have a pointer here, that in the mining districts, there's tremendous amounts of sediment with terraces, and we can still see that today. They're eroding and they're getting smaller, but there's still lots of sediment up in the mountains. And down in the lower rivers, this is the Yuba River near Timbuktu Bend, there's tremendous amounts of sediment there. Not surprising, we, we still see lots of sediment in these locations, up and around the mines and down in the Sacramento Valley where the gradients change. But in the gorges between, even by the time Gilbert got there 20 years later, most of the sediment is gone if there ever was much sediment storage in the canyons. But if you look closely, you can see there's a fine grain sediment in the interstices of these boulders and cobbles. This is the sediment in transport. So this is a zone of transport where there's a tremendous amount of translation of debris still coming down, and he captures it on film. So I want to talk about four innovative aspects of Professional Paper 105. Uh, these are things that I think should be famous or that, that this monograph should be well known for. The first one is the one that is most cited, sediment waves. This is probably by far the most citations to this monograph come from the concept of sediment waves. It's my least favorite and I'm going to talk somewhat critically about it because there's, some, there's a lot of misinterpretation of sediment waves. But we also want to look at sediment budgets, integrated watershed analysis, and anthropogenic change. These are major innovations in this work. So the sediment wave theory is derived from three stream flow gauge sites where he, uh, he plots historical gauge data for low flows. And so essentially we're looking at the channel bed rise up from 1850 to oh, about 1910 is, the, is when this data set stops. And it's been continued in modern studies to show that as Gilter, Gilbert predicted, the bed, channel bed would return back down to its original level. By the mid 60s, the channel bed had returned to its original level. Now let's take a little closer look at this. Uh, the three gauge sites, one is the Narrows up in the Yuba Gorge uh, where, where its, its flows are deep and narrow and we would not expect long sediment trans, uh, storage in this area. The other two sites are Marysville at the mouth of the Yuba River right there and the Sacramento River at Sacramento. These sites are levied. I know the, the, the Marysville site was dredged. So when we look at the Marysville gauge channel bed coming up and coming down, we should realize that in 1905 the channel was dredged and the levees were built intentionally with a constriction going from three kilometers spacings to 600 meter spacings intentionally so it would capture the sediment and not introduce that sediment to the Feather River below, which was navigable, which had been navigable. So the levee system was designed to catch sediment 
and the gay side is right in the throat of that narrows. So it should not be a surprise that the channel bed scours, but there's a tremendous amount of sediment still remaining in the area. This is right at Marysville. There's five and a half meters of historical sediment on top of the old soil. And I th Gilbert didn't have these exposures. This is now. This is, you know, in 1905 when he was running around here, this was still fully aggraded. The channel bed was still up there. You can see the channel bed is still up here. Um, later, we see this sediment is still eroding. So the problem with the sediment wave theory is that people conflate bed elevation with sediment flux. The bed goes up, it comes down, it, it aggrades and degrades, but then there's a long period of adjustment. This is well noted by the channel evolution theory. The channel evolution model says that after a channel incises into a narrow channel, it then widens out over a period of time and it generates a new meander belt or braid belt at a lower level. And during that period, it's generating a lot of sediment. So we should recognize that this sediment is still, this is in the Feather River down below, this sediment is still being delivered. And also, we have a series, in this location, the channel hasn't returned to its pre-mining level yet. These are contemporaneous trees, uh, carbon dated at about 1885. So uh, the river hasn't reached its former level yet. And if, if that's not convincing, then mercury is a smoking gun. The, only the mining sediment has the mercury. The pre-mining sediment does not. I'll say more about mercury later. So I would say that a more realistic model of sediment flux would be a, a skewed model where this is an idealized schematic without any data. It's just, a, it's just a model, conceptual model. But the channel bed can come up and come down fairly quickly and, and define a more symmetrical model as, as Gilbert's sediment wave shows. But if we're really looking at sediment flux, we would expect a long extracted period. This becomes very important when we apply something like the sediment wave model to legacy sediment in agricultural areas, like the Chesapeake Bay. You get a massive influx of agriculturally derived sediment it's stored on floodplains throughout the system, and it's still coming down. The people working around here are, are studying it now, and it's very well documented. There's banks are still producing elevated levels of sediment to the system. So we should not make that mistake. So the sediment wave model is an, a very important principle. It's a very important co concept that Gilbert gave to us, but let's not abuse it. Let's keep it, let's interpret it correctly. What is often overlooked in Gilbert's work is the sediment budget. Uh, he introduced a quantitative, semi-distributed sediment budget. Uh, he, well, uh, shown right here is the production from the mines, the amount of sediment produced from the mines, and then he had also the amount of sediment stored throughout the different major watersheds, and from that, you can get the sediments delivered by subtracting the storage from the production. And you get a sediment delivery uh, model here. And then he went on, which is really incredible, he went on to, to measure or estimate, he didn't measure, he estimated the non-mining sediment. And here's where he got into what was pretty, pretty much uncharted territory, soil erosion, and he's really got it here that the production is equal to the mining sediment plus the agricultural sediment plus the, I can't read that, oh, I should read it over here, the roads, trails, grazing, or pasture. And he comes up with estimates of these. Now, there's no soil conservation service for another 20 years. There's no precedence, there's no data. So he just makes his best estimates he can, but he shows us the way this should be done. 20 years later, we get the soil conservation movement, and we, we start developing methods to do this. And today, of course, we could do this a lot better. Uh, his photographs, again, are wonderful. You don't see photographs from this era talking about soil erosion with gullies and rills and road ruts and so forth. Uh, 
He was very concerned with this. He showed us the way. Now, I see a red light flashing on me, so I'm going to try to speed through some of this. Uh, his sediment budgets have not been reproduced or validated, so we've ran a, a pilot study up in Steep Hollow Creek, one of the smaller watersheds up there with the mines, and we have, using DEMs of difference, digital elevation models, differencing from, from a pre-mining to a, when the LIDAR were flown to the... Uh, maximum period of mining and we get two different two different time periods I'm gonna to have to skate over some of this and we can do that for the mines is in that last photograph and we can do that for the valley bottoms below steep hollow creek has very straight valley sides so the contours are evenly spaced so we can just keep manually put in contours down below the mining sediment and model the base of the channel that way and by subtracting the DEMs, we get a DEM of difference, a DOD, and that gives us volume. So we can come up with a sediment budget for 1884, or maximum period, and uh, it's 23.5 million cubic meters in this small upper watershed were produced, 7.2 cub million cubic meters were stored originally, and there remains 3.5 no, 3.7 million cubic meters there now. So we can go on and do sediment delivery ratios. This actually would be 70%, one minus 30, and 84%. We could do sediment delivery ratios. We can distribute the sediment budget, and we can do this throughout the mining area where we have LIDAR data. Uh, integrated watershed analysis. This is one of the great innovations of Gilbert that I don't think people are, are, have recognized, or not explicitly. People have always moved by the idea that he follows the sediment from the mountains out to the San Francisco Bay, and his scale is incredible, and people recognize that. But they don't recognize it in the modern context of what we now consider standard practice is watershed analysis. Uh, Integrated watershed analysis means not just a, the big space and looking at spatially integrated, but it's also multidisciplinary and looking at not just the biological or not just the sediment. And Gilbert gets us started in that direction. He looks at the soil erosion, he looks at the sediment, he looks at the engineering works and so forth. So it's, a, it's an innovative in that approach. I'm going to skip over this diagram, but this, this is loaded with his information, his thinking on the on the process. And oh, I do want to say one thing. He, he points out here that production of sediment has already dropped below soil erosion at this time. And he predicts that it will drop below, that the uh, delivery, this curve here, the delivery of mining sediment will ultimately drop below soil erosion. This is a schematic to demonstrate that. Okay. Uh, this is the premier predecessor of the legacy sediment movement. This paper was the first uh, scientific study to really examine uh, the, the importance of humans to, to the landscape. I know there's others, but, but this is by the master himself. And uh, since George Perkin Marsh's book in 1865, Nothing like this had been done before. And Gilbert not only makes this, uh, promotes this and shows that this, this is important, the him, impacts of humans. This paper is widely read, but he also adds the scientific rigor to show the importance. I did a quick analysis of legacy sediment on floodplains and just mapped out studies. And Gilbert's importance, you can see it here, is that there's a series of other studies that have followed it. And then Stafford Happ, who worked in the lower Mississippi at Vicksburg, and he also did a study in South Carolina, and he did Coon Creek up in Wisconsin. He promoted a bunch of follow-up studies by others. Uh, John Costa, Rob Jacobson up in the middle Atlantic, Trimble in the southeast, and Jim Knox up in the Driftless area. You could argue from this that th what we know about legacy sediment is based on precursors, early studies that were catalysts, and Gilbert was the first of them all.
Uh, the modern implications, very briefly here, um, mercury, we now know there's lots of mercury in those sediments. There was, uh, there's very little natural mercury that occurs in the Sierra, but they brought it by mules up into the mines and put it into their flumes by the jug load, literally sometimes by the gallon, poured mercury into the flumes. And we see it in fish assay assays. The, the Bear and the South Yuba rivers, which are the most intensely sedimented, have the highest concentrations. And we see it also in the sediments that moving downstream from the fan apex of the Yuba, which is right around the Narrows that we saw earlier, we see a decline in, in mercury concentrations. And I'll say that I'll have to skip over the equilibrium part and go to the conclusion. Um, this, I, I feel that this is his capstone piece of work, but it's been underappreciated. Uh, there's no point in comparing this with the others in terms of what's better or anything like that, but it's, this is, this is uh, it deserves to be considered along with his other monographs as a classic. Uh, sediment budgets, watershed management, environmental stewardship, anthropogenic sediment, we should see it at the same level as we see, uh, see the others. Thank you. We'll take time for just one question. Even while peering into the bright lights, I see no hands, so <laughs> we'll move on then to our next speaker. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Our next presentation is from Vic Baker from University of Arizona. So we'll get the slides here. Um, while we're doing that, I'll make one brief, brief comment on the previous talk. Actually, G.K. Gilbert's final paper was published posthumously. It was a USGS professional paper on the basin and range structure. He actually began work on it during the Wheeler survey. So it was nearly 50 years from initiation to publication, and that includes the infamous USGS delay in publication. G.K. Gilbert once famously noted that if the scientist describes in his paper the exact things he did to come up with his ideas, he contributes doubly to the cause of science. We don't do that today. We write up the results and we try to convince others of how logical we were to come up with those results. We don't tell them the messy thinking that goes into that. So we don't follow Gilbert's advice. Gilbert wrote a couple of papers on how one does science. These are not as well known as the exemplars that he provided in that. But these papers are rather controversial. Interestingly, they have been highly criticized by philosophers of science. So how do I change this thing? Is there a button? Oh, okay. okay. Do, can I change it? Yeah, with that. Oh, that button. Okay, great. Okay, so these are two famous papers you've heard about. And these are the two we're going to talk about. The one on the right is the 1896 science paper on the origin of hypotheses. And on the left is the uh, inculcation of scientific method in which uh, Gilbert uses an example from, Southern, from, from Utah, and it is the Lake Bonneville example. So Gilbert states in a presidential address in 1885 that uh, 
he is going to discuss things in, in, in the context of both teaching, interestingly, and logic. And in doing so, he is not going to use the standard scientific terminology of cause and effect. So he begins this by saying, phenomena are arranged in chains of necessary consequence. In other words, he's putting on nature a logic, that there's a logic in nature. I'm going to come back to this point. In such a chain, each link is the necessary consequent of that which precedes and the necessary antecedent of that which follows. And he goes on to state, it is the province of research to discover the antecedents of phenomena. And this is done by the aid of hypothesis. Gilbert then goes on to present what has been a mystery to a lot of people since, his analogic proportion. So here's the analogical proportion. Given a phenomenon A whose antecedent we seek, first we ransack the memory for some different phenomenon B which has one or more features in common with A and whose antecedent we know. We then pass by analogy from the antecedent of B to the hypothetical antecedent of A, solving the analogic proportion as B is to A, so is the antecedent of B to the antecedent of A. As I said, <laughs> caused a lot of confusion can change the terminology a little bit to cause and effect, and then we see what Gilbert is really saying is we have a phenomenon, we want to understand uh, how that comes about, we want to know the formative processes for A, so, but to do this we look at another phenomenon B which has two qualities. One is it has key features in common with A. We can only know this by experience, of course, so this can't be done uh, without a level of experience. So it has similar morphological details to A. And for that other phenomenon, we, it has causes that we truly know. Sir Isaac Newton called this vera causa, and he recognized in his physical philosophy that you have to know the true causes of things before you can apply principles and mathematics and theory and everything else. You've got to know the true causes to begin with. And that actually, and it's beyond the scope of what I'm going to talk about here, was the basis for what geologists called uniformitarianism, the seeking of true causes. But if you have A and B that are indeed similar, then the causes of A will allow us to infer what could be reasonably the causes of A. It does not justify the truth of that inference, but it leads one on a productive route of inquiry. That is the purpose. So this has been highly criticized. It was not in line with the major theme of philosophy of science of the 20th century, which is called logical empiricism. David Kitts wrote about this, excoriating Gilbert for not mentioning law or theory in his methodology. He says that Gilbert's uh, philosophical antecedents are obscure. Is he an inductivist or a deductivist? Because the logical positivists thought there's only two forms of logical inference, induction and deduction. Gilbert's talking about something else. What is he? He's operating outside any philosophical, f familiar philosophical tradition. So he has been criticized as philosophically naive. That is wrong. He was not operating outside a philosophical position. So Gilbert also distinguishes investigators from theorists. The one, he says, meaning the investigator, seeks diligently for the facts which would, may overthrow his tentative theory. The other, meaning the theorist, closes his eyes to these and searches only for those that will sustain it. Notice that he's talking about attitudes. He's not talking about methodology. He's talking about a scientific attitude that's absolutely critical. So in 1895, Gilbert, in an address to the Geological Society of Washington, so we're here, 
He expands upon his 1886 paper, and he begins this by saying, when the investigator, notice, he is always talking about investigation, having under consideration a group of facts uh, or <clears throat> whose origin or cause is unknown, seeks to discover their origin, his first step is to make a guess, a guess. This sends logical positivists up a tree. They can't imagine that scientists would be making guesses. But this is not some rube in Las Vegas playing a roulette wheel. This is Grove Carl Gilbert with an incredible amount of experience. This is not a normal kind of guess. So in this paper, the paper got famous because Gilbert uses his example of Coon Bluff in uh, northern Arizona. And Gilbert had been studying the San Francisco volcanic peaks as shown in the upper picture. And uh, he ultimately comes to a conclusion about Coon Bluff that it's what later got called a cryptovolcanic. So the erroneous uh, view of that became famous over time, but the critical part of the paper is the methodology that he used to come with this view. There's uh, a lot to be said about difference between the 1886 and 1896 uh, papers, and uh, I can't go into this. I have written about this in other places, but by 1896, he is going much more directly from observation, not from standard kinds of induction, but to the guess. And very important from the guess is to deduce the consequences from that. And that leads to a test, but the testing is not exactly what we would think of a test, which is correspondence between the hypothetical inference and some observation. That is only one kind of testing. Gilbert actually says something else about testing, but before I get uh, to that, I want to just point out that, again, he's not claiming that hypotheses uh, derive specifically from theory, but by the direct study of nature. They arise through analogical reasoning, and he says that tentative explanations are always founded on accepted explanations of similar phenomena. The successful field investigator must be skilled in the fertility of hypothesis invest, uh, invention, which implies a wide and varied knowledge of the causes of things and the understanding of nature in her varied aspects. This is the essential part of the intellectual equipment of the investigator. So back to the criticism of this, uh, Kitts, who sort of exemplifies the logical positive view, says that argument and logic uh, arise in test procedures. This is the famous justification argument of uh, philosophers of science. And he further asserts well-known and widely accepted uh, geological principles and physical theories provide not only our only means of justifying hypotheses about the antecedents of phenomena, but our principal source of such hypotheses. So he says Gilbert is completely wrong about this. So Gilbert, he asserts the method of hypotheses is the method of science, not what the logical positives talk about as the method of science. And it founds its explanations of nature wholly on observed facts, and its results are ever subject to the limitations from that. Then he makes another remarkable statement. However grand, however widely accepted, however useful its conclusion, none is so sure that it cannot be called into question by a newly discovered fact. In the domain of the world's knowledge, there is no infallibility. This is fallibilism. Fallibilism was made famous by Sir Karl Popper, who, among other things, claimed he was the inventor of the idea. Popper was very arrogant in this regard, but he wasn't. Gilbert pointed this out long before Popper. 
You, you also can detect in what I said, Gil Gilbert had an inkling of what Popper's falsificationism was about. So let's get back to testing. The, the common view of testing is that we have a correspondence with a deduction or prediction we make from some theoretical statement to uh, a possible observed phenomenon. We see that phenomenon and then we conclude that our theory is potentially correct. Some will even say it is correct. What Gilbert says, if the phenomenon was re really produced in the hypothetic manner, then it should possess, in addition to the features already observed, certain other specific features, and the discovery of these will serve to verify the hypothesis. In other words, he's, your, your, your hypothesis leads you to look at new things, and those new things become the things that show you you're on the right path toward the truth. Now, he is stating something that was stated by a philosopher who was rejected by the logical positivists, who actually was the greatest philosopher of geology of the 19th century. And that was William Hewell, W-H-E-W-E-L, like many good geological philosophers, it's hard to pronounce his name properly. And William Hewell invented the term consilience. Consilience occurs when a hypothesis leads to a kind of explanatory surprise in which a completely different set of phenomena from that being tentatively explained is discovered or recognized, such that the newly recognized phenomena are clearly related to the phenomena under investigation, and they are adequately explained by the tentative hypothesis that was easily, uh, that was originally proposed. It does not confer truth by formal logic. Rather, it is showing that one is on the path to reality for which that hypothesis is a tool. And it is, uh, uh, Hewell pointed out, it is associated with the most fruitful of scientific investigations. He developed this idea by his intense study of the history of all different kinds of science. By the way, Hewell was once a president of what's now the Geological Society of London. He was a prominent philosopher of geology. Here's his picture. He is one of the few statues in Trinity College Chapel, uh, Cambridge, along with Newton and Bacon and other luminaries. Uh, one of his famous views was nature is the book and man is the interpreter. Uh, man is the interpreter of nature. He said science is the right interpretation. I would modify that to say science is the absolute path toward the right interpretation. Having the right interpretation, of course, is uh, not a path forward. It's the end, so it would be the end of science to have something absolutely correct. So, uh, following these ideas, it's not possible to do controlled experiments on a lot of the things we deal with in the earth sciences. There must be alternative means to test or corroborate various hypotheses to totally controlled experimentation. And this includes evaluating the consequences of those hypotheses by such things as consilience, and I would add to that consistency and coherence. So analogies, they don't provide complete explanations. The investigator uh, presumes a reasonable, uh, reasonable analogy as possibly true, and then result uh, with the aid of the classification of phenomena and the re recognition of potential a uh, analogs and corroboration of working hypotheses uses these methods of consistency, coherence, and consilience in the course of an investigation. Now, all of this we can now subsume under a terminology that has become very prominent in areas such as artificial intelligence called abductive inference, where evidence uh, of a phenomena are discovered and the experienced investigator then infers the responsible conditions from that evidence. So we're not talking about mere deduction or induction. 
the investigator noticed something unusual in the field. They are attracted to that on the basis of their experience with a lot of phenomena. But if something that were to lead to that was known to be true, then that result would be a matter of course. Hence, there is a reason to suspect that this set of ex explanatory theory, if you will, is possibly true, and therefore it constitutes a fruitful hypothesis that can go into the subsequent investigation. So this is very different than the deduc deductive science that was promoted by the logical positivists. There, the theorist in deduces the idealized properties of the phenomena and then tests the deductions or predictions, if you will, by correspondence, which is best done through a controlled experiment. Here's a diagram from a very well-known uh, artificial intelligence pioneer, John Sawa, and you notice he puts the investigator in the center of this. And his process includes things that philosophers of science have emphasized, deduction leading to uh, uh, relationship to the world and testing and induction uh, dealing with the measurements from that world. But all of that is grist for the mill of abductive inference which is associated with the uh, tremendous qualities of the uh, very seasoned investigator. Sherlock Holmes is shown there for a good reason. Now all of this, and I don't have time to talk about this aspect of it, is something that was elaborated as a methodology for science by a contemporary of G.K. Gilbert. And that person was Charles Saunders Peirce. He was essentially a geophysicist who worked for the Coast Survey. But his real passion was logic. You can look at Gilbert's writing and, and Peirce's writing and you can see this logical uh, exposition. Uh, Gilbert knew Peirce. He had interactions with him. It's been hard to trace this, but he probably had a beginning interaction with, over the concept of weighing the Earth in 1873. In 1884, he had a major exchange of papers uh, with Peirce on the idea of predicting tornadoes. Peirce felt that geology was an abductive science, and he probably influenced these ideas I've expressed for Gilbert. So I'll leave with the, uh, the uh, statements of Gilbert about the nature of hypotheses as a scientific guess. Gilbert's fallibilism, I think, is a, one of the great um, uh, things to provide to students about Gilbert's thinking. And I'll list some references here. I have a lot to thank my uh, sometimes student, Steve Pine, with whom I wrote an early paper about Gilbert and geomorphology. Uh, I encouraged Steve to work, who was working with Getzman as his major advisor, to take up Gilbert as his uh, PhD dissertation. And uh, I think that's uh, helped the cause that we have here quite a lot. So sorry for using up all this time. Is there an investigator out there with a question? And remember, there's a um, microphone right in the middle of the aisle there, right behind you. Um, yeah, please, yeah, go, f yeah. So, on, is it on? Okay, the, on the two slides, there were two opposite words. One was underdetermination, and the other was overdetermination. And you argued that overdetermination is the reason we can do abductive inference, but wouldn't you, <coughs> agree that we actually are usually underdetermined in testing alternative hypotheses when we're out in the field. We often lack evidence. We're always searching for evidence. 
and use statistical techniques to actually be able to try and overcome the underdetermination. Yeah, yeah the, I, I ran those words by it because that's, uh, those are current uh, hot points in the newer philosophy of science. The underdetermination thesis uh, applies to the issue of the, the classic way the logical empiricist thought about it, which is that you deduce things, you, you, uh, you have phenomena, and the evidence is never sufficient to uh, falsify or verify the uh, multiple combinations of things that could yield to a particular result. That is a logic principle. Overdetermination is a principle that has to do with uh, ontology, the nature of the world. Overdetermination is a property of the world, not a property of our thinking about the world. Overdetermination, uh, a good example is you have a volcanic eruption. How did you know this occurred? You have an incredible amount of stuff. Tephra blasted across landscapes, landforms that were created. The event, the process, is manifested in so much information that is out there in the natural world that that is overdetermined. The uh, philosopher of science, Carol Cleland, has written extensively about this aspect in relationship to geology, but there's not enough time to go into all the modern uh, takes on this stuff. Yeah. Gordon, did you want to ask a quick one before we transition? Well, of course, he wrote that well before the 1886 and the 1896 papers. So obviously, Gilbert's thinking is evolving. He also wrote that before he met Peirce. Maybe there may be something there. Uh, this this relationship to Peirce, I didn't get into my paper from uh, 1996 is a beginning to that. Uh, connection, but uh, there's a lot more work to be done on it. So I'd like to introduce our, introduce our last speaker, Bill Dietrich from University of California at Berkeley. Hello out there. Um, so I was asked to speak about um, Gilbert's um, hydraulic, um, his paper on the transport of debris by running water. Here's one measure of it. This is the citations to this paper over time. Clearly Gilbert rode the wa wave of increasing numbers of people publishing papers, but he rose that, rode that wave into a high number. He's, hitting about 35 papers a year now, citation. What has led to this enduring um, uh, reference to his work? What is it that's made him continue to be such influential force in our field today? I want to, uh, as Bob did, and as Vic did and others did, he wrote so eloquently, I, I'm gonna occasionally quote from him directly so you can get his approach. Uh, 35 years ago, the writer made a study of the work of streams in shaping the face of the, load, the, the land. Excuse me. 
The study in included a qualitative and partly deductive investigation of the laws of the transportation of debris by running water. And the limitations of such methods inspired a desire for quantitative data such as could be obtained only by experimentation with determinate conditions. The gratification of this desire was long deferred, but for opportunity for experimentation finally came in connection with the investigation of what's been called the hydraulic mine waste problem that um, we heard about before. So I want you to put yourself in his shoes. Um, here's active sediment transport, mixed grains, unsteady, fines going past course, then course rolling over fines, and no one has described this before. There is no advanced hydraulic theory, there is no bed load theory. And he says, this bed load is inaccessible, we are without a definite information as to its amount. The primary purpose of this investigation was to learn the laws which control the movement of bed load, especially to determine how the quantity of the load is related to the streams. This is his hypothesis, slope, discharge, and degree of comminution, which he meant by grain size. So seeing a channel like this, how do you do a calculation when you're starting from no previous work? And you have other stream types. He would see streams with bed forms in them. He would see storp, uh, these, these steep canyon rivers with all, uh, big rocks and fine stuff cr crossing over it. He would see the streams cutting through canyons and the heavy mountains, and he'd see the work of streams cutting entire landscapes. And he's trying to uh, stand back and say, what is this bed load phenomenon in this context? So he began his experiments in 1907 and ran to 1909, but ill health forced him to cease work, and E.C. Murphy carried it on. He returned to the East where he continued on data analysis until his publication in 1914. And uh, I'm going to quote now uh, uh, from a person who reviewed his work and said, if this report had a defect, it lay in the difficulty of applying its results to actual problems in river engineering. This is important, a difficulty which Gilbert himself saw and lamented. It is because of the abstract nature of its results that this study seems not to deserve so high a rank as a sequel, which we just heard about. His occasional mathematical discussions, on which the most elaborate example is his next to last publication, are sometimes difficult to follow, not from obscurity on his part, but from prevailing mathematical lameness <laughs> on the part of the would-be follower. It constituted the most arduous task that Gilbert ever entered, and the, this was written by William Morris Davis. Now, um, another comment. One of, the, one of the most often referenced papers in the large literature on sediment transport is a famous paper by Gilbert, presented his data on ex experiments in sediment transport. Interestingly, although this paper is probably quoted in references more often than nearly any other paper on the general subject, I added the italics, few people seem to have read it carefully. It is true the analytical part of this document is complicated and the approach reflects the fact that at times many things that are now taken for granted when were, uh, were not known. Luna Leopold. So what is this about this paper that's caused these comments? Well, here's the outline of this report. And in red are what people read. In black, people look at it and move on. Why is that, and what is this, why is, is that a problem? Um, are we all mathematically lame, or what does this mean? So uh, I'm, gonna I'm gonna introduce some observations now and come to this analysis of uh, what this paper contributes. And so he introduced this idea of the term capacity, the maximum load uh, of a given kind of debris, grain size, which a stream can carry. Load, the quantity of debris transported by stream through any cross-section in a unit of time if it's load is, uh, of its, its load at a section, excuse me. It is a general fact that the loads of streams falling on bedrock are less than the capacity. See the difference between load and capacity. But dragging debris over the rock, it files or corrodes the bed of its channel. Competence, the conditions in which grains start to move. <laughs> Competence, the ability to find the point to touch the thing. Um, okay, <laughs> efficiency, another relevant word here. Um, the quotient of capacity by the product of discharge and slope, a measure of a stream's potential work of transport in relation to its potential energy. We look at this again and we see that this is, capacity is what most bed load transport models predict for equilibrium state and there's an interesting review by Wainwright about capacity. Load. 
he saw the role of sediment in cutting channels and concluded that it seized when the river was at capacity and the bed was covered with sediment. We now refer to confidence as initial motion and threshold motion. Efficiency. This is essentially the Bagnall hypothesis and is used by many stream power theories since then. Now, his, he had to, felt he had to introduce some terms. The French word that he found in his work in the, uh, European literature was entrainment, and he replaced that with fra uh, traction, which is widely used, so hydraulic traction, his term is traction. Secondly, he quote, this is his wording, previous to the Berkeley work, little was known of the quantitative laws of stream traction, bed load transport. The quantity of material transport has sometimes been said to be proportional to square slope, but I have failed to discover that statement as a recorded basis of theory of observation. So he's starting from scratch. And here's how he scratches up an incredible data set. He built three flumes, not one flume. He built this flume um, uh, that's 31 feet long, in which he, um, at the upstream end of the flume, added sediment um, here. And the sediment would pile up and advance as a ramp down until it fell out of trough. He even had a contractor to, at the end to make it narrow so the sediment would uh, add, uh, continuously add, uh, fall into the trough at the end. So it was add sediment, create a load, and look at the response uh, to that. He built another flume. This flume, he put a glass plate on it, and he could have a slider along it. He could walk along the pace of the sediment so he could stabilize and look at what's going on. He looked inside the flume. And then he built this thing, which is often sited outside uh, one of the buildings on campus. Um, and in here, he Oops, and here he, he put it a, a, what he called a crooked or sinuous channel to see what the effect that, that would have on sediment transport. And he also studied transport over fixed beds, not just alluvial beds. He used a, a, a range of um, sort of uh, uniform grain sizes and did ex, uh, his experiments of dropping sediment in and note what he writes here. Um, by adding the sediment, slope was thus, quote, automatically adjusted and became just efficient to enable the particular discharge to transport that particular quality of sand. So the slope is the response variable that he measures, and, it's, and he measures the slope of the deposit. He had trouble measuring the slope of the water surface. He does um, six discharges, six widths, eight grades of sediment. He does 130 combinations of runs. In addition, he does mixed grain sizes, and he does transport with fixed beds. This is a phenomenal contribution of data. Uh, it, it, does, it isn't just some beyond what anyone's done before. It's a, it's a, a mammoth data set that hasn't really been repeated a, a, as he has done it. Now, let's look at what um, he saw. So he looked through his last play as he walked along, and he saw this phenomenon he called saltation, that grains would be launched and um, saltating particles are launched as they ride uh, up over blocking grains, travel in the flow, and settle back down. He proposed that, in effect, these salting grains, I'm putting words, uh, modifying this to say, extract momentum, he said reduce velocity, reducing the velocity, which reduces the power to cause particles to leap, and thus setting a load. So his way, his reasoning for what controls the amount of sediment transport is you increase the number of particles, increase the concentration, extract momentum, and that reduces the ability to entrain more particles. He reasoned this through by looking along his glass plate. Um, the greater the load, the greater this reduction, and thus the quantity of load is automatically set. He also did studies on components, and this is what we mean by that, where particles are just about to start to move. But he also did experiments on um, adding fine sediments to, with coarse sediments and seeing the behavior. I don't know how to turn the sound off. Um, Okay, um, I'll speak loudly. Um, so he, total uh, capacity increased with addition of fines. I couldn't resist not showing this super nerdy diagram of his, which is on, uh, he's taken two grain sizes, a coarse, a fine size and a coarse size. And he's then uh, done mixtures of addition. So this is the, the mixtures. This is all coarse sediment dumped into the trough to all fine sediment dumped in the trough and looked at the proportion then of the coarse sediment transport. So of course it's zero over there. But look what he finds. Adding fines to the bed increases the transport and mobilizes the coarse sediment so there's even more coarse sediment transported than by itself alone. And he reasons through 
that in other words, large particles are moved more readily on the smoother bed, and this fact also is a matter of direct observation. The promotion ability applies not only to the starting of the grain, but to its continuous in motion. It encounters less resistance as it rolls or skips along the bed, and less act to be arrest, arrested. Whew. Okay. He also did a lot of work in sand-sized particles and observed the dune flatbed antidune transition, and of course, antidune is his term. He observed the phenomena you see here of at supercritical flow dunes forming and advancing upstream. And he, he explored the domains under which that occurred. And he called this rhythm, which I like. Um, now, now he's done these observations to see how the phenomenon works. Now he wants to establish laws. So he, a procedure he uses is for a given width and discharging grain size, he wants to find the best representation of capacity versus slope. And so he says, well, I'll plot this in log log space. And these proposed formulas might, he has comes up with six possible ways to fit lines through this log log space. And he picks ones that go through the data but also don't do funny things like turn around and come back down. And he ends up arriving at a plot that, an equation that looks like this. Capacity equals a number times slope minus a critical slope, the competence slope, raised to an exponent. He then he makes 30 interocular observations about initial motion and finds that critical slope. So now he can plot capacity against S minus critical slope and, and determine B1 and N. He also inferred that with the depth to width ratio affects transport and also that the competence value somehow varies with uh, grain size. He repeats this analysis, capacity as a function of discharge and excess discharge, excess uh, grain size, above competence, and this with the death ratio. A combination of intu intuition and data testing. No mechanistic derived equation uh, was uh, proposed. This is what everyone comes for. They harvest this data. Um, this is the raw observation presented in a very clear way that everyone uses to test the theory. And it's published and it's available now on the web very easily. This is his observations on initial motion, very well described, explaining exactly why he thought he saw initial motion. Okay, a quote from him. In my work, I have struck another stretch of computing again. The office has loaned me Mr. His facility with the slide rule makes, it, makes me wish I'd learned it years ago. Um, he, he, he wrote to his son um, at this time, and he used this... Um, uh, approximation to writing to, for fun. He also wrote, shall know right smart of hydraulics and some hydrodynamics when I get through. So you can see he's really working hard at this. Now, this is what he also did. He took his plot, there are the data points and there's a line, and he said, well look, if this is right, then the data should fall on the line. So he created a whole other data table, which is he adjusted the points to be on the line. So they're, they're, they're coexisting. That's what he called the adjusted data set. And he proceeded then to fit equations for slope excess, discharge excess, grain size excess, and a width to death ratio term. And in the end, combined that to a, uh, a multiply them together. What you're looking at is a handmade multivariate analysis before it had been possible to do such. And he intuited, well, I want, he wanted to keep the controls separate. Let's just see what slope does. Let's just see what um, discharge does. Let's just see what grain size does and with the death ratio. But he didn't stop there. He said, well, I recognize that the uh, exponents and coefficients themselves are a function of other things. So he proceeded to look at those possible relationships and expand upon this equation. And the result is 82 equations over 114 pages devoted to detailed attempts to establish the controls on the slope and the, and the, uh, the incompetent slope and the discharge, the competence discharge and the uh, width to death ratio and that competence value and other things. That, and you can see now that that is um, uh, led to a very long set of, of uh, chapters which people now do not read um, at all. Um, it was the primary purpose of the Berkeley investigation to determine for rivers the relation in which the load swept along the bed bears to the important um, factors of control. 
It was proposed to study the mode of propulsion and learn empirically the laws connected its output with each factor of control taken separately. The review of results show that the primary purpose was not accomplished. A body of definite information is contributed to the general subject of stream work. A valuable outcome is the knowledge that the output of tractional load is related to the controlling conditions in a highly complex manner. The law of control for each condition being qu qualified by all other conditions. So this is why there is not, despite him doing this phenomenal work, a Gilbert sediment transport equation. Because he broke things apart and tried to peak, uh, find association by that and then pick apart all the variations. And he realized when he got deep into the trees, he could not possibly take this back out into a natural setting. But his data lives on because he so carefully did his experiments and so carefully described them that this became the catalyst for a field of investigation. This is the foundation paper by Shields where he establishes the empirical non-dimensional uh, um, uh, stress and non-dimensional grain size relationships to what's now known as the Shields diagram. This is this original work on the conditions for initial motion where Gilbert's data plays a fundamental role. We still do this today. Here's a recent paper uh, exploring other ways, other theories that might explain the observations made by Gilbert and then joined by others. This is an original graph by Bagnold. And look what Bagnold says. Very few of the many, many laboratory transport measurements extend to higher stages, et cetera. Although now half a century old, Gilbert's work still provides the majority of available data. This enabled Bagnall, to, with some confidence, to propose his now widely recognized transport as a function of stream power. This is the work by Pat Weiberg, where she proposed a fully mechanistic explanation coupling the, the, to drive uh, sediment transport of bed load by hydraulic processes, and importantly, to account for the resistance effects of bed forms to test her model. This is the work by Gary Parker on surface-based transport theory, which is the most widely used equation for routing of mixed grain sizes in riverbeds, showing that his model, derived independently from Oak Creek data, actually applies to Gilbert's data, giving further strength to it. And we continue right up to today. She and Diplis published a couple of months ago an improved method for using a stream power approach in which they rely on Gilbert's data to see if it makes sense. And it continues with discrete element modeling. These folks cite Gilbert as a motivation to explore more fully how slope is a controlling factor in sediment transport, but now doing using discrete element modeling. And we are now able to do things like this, couple a hydrodynamic model with the sediment transport model and predict the evolution uh, down slope from a bump of par bars and pools and the difference between what's lying on the surface, what's carried in the load by building upon the model, the sediment transport model that ultimately came verified or, and, and motivated by Gilbert's work. Um, so, a perspective. Engineers have played the primary role in advancing theory and observations. Gilbert has tended to, um, uh, but have tended to see slope as a given and transport as a response variable. In textbooks and review papers on bed load transport, setup supply is rarely mentioned. And here's a quote from uh, a few years ago. I don't believe rivers are lone wolves in the wilderness howling for sediment. But my, my phone is, or somebody's is. Okay. But we now see a, calc a beautiful calculation in Gary's ebook where we see increase the transport uh, supply rate and see the slope in grain, si grain size adjust. Rivers respond to sediment supply. And this is a perspective that I think that Gilbert had in the design of experiments in his field work, which is to look at a spot in the river and think, what's coming from upstream? What's the rate of addition? What's the dynamics that have happened en route that affect the sediment amount, the size, and the texture, and the, and the rate of flux coming through here? And this is expressed visually by uh, Mike Church, where the emphasis on s increasing sediment supply and on morphology is suggested. And this is then followed up by papers that have cited par um, uh, Gilbert as a motivation on the impact of core sediment supply on hydraulics and sediment supply. And then two papers at this meeting that are on sediment supply that have their core, this perspective of supply, grain size, and um, slope. And then we come back to this mixed grain sediment transport. In the
horrific, ah, you did it, noise, um, and two recent papers that rediscovered the work by Gilbert in the mixtures of realizing how grains interact and mobilize each other. And then we can't resist. This is a photograph from Mars. And we see lima bean shaped grains, sorted sediment, the first on the ground evidence that definitively says we had fluvial transport that supports the decades of work by geomorphologists interpreting channels on Mars, not due to lava flows, but actually water transport, and allowing us to use the Shields diagram, which is based on Dilbert's observations to do some calculations of what the flows were like. So we come to this. Um, Gilbert referred to this ways and means as how to reach the Henry Mountains. And you could say how to reach an understanding of river mechanics is this. And one feeds the other through theory. And we come to the final statement then, which is Gilbert taught us to go into the field to observe openly, but to ask questions and seek explanations. We need to ask how does the landscape work and seek deeply mechanistic explanations. He showed us that we could bring the field and the laboratory and test our ideas and make discoveries that we can and must take back into the field. And even if our original ideas were wrong, as was the case with Gilbert, good observations, carefully made and recorded for all to use, can catalyze new work and new understanding, hence the title, Good Data Are Eternal. Thank you. Questions? There's a microphone in the aisle if you want to uh, work your way down. Come on, Martin, you will say something. Leonard. Okay, I, I don't know how to repeat your question. How did Gilbert, what? How is his, his daily life as a scientist, how does that differ from ours today, where we have so much data and 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 so much What's really strange, is, and others may have a different perception, um, is he stuck with this idea that I'm going to look at the variables in isolation. And yet he writes in uh, Henry Mountains, and he writes in this report extensively about the idea of work and stream power. He could have so easily made the plot that Bagnall did 50 years later and seen, oh, I can consolidate all this. He says it in words. It's efficiency, the ratio of the two. And he didn't. And I'm only hypothesizing, I might need um, Vic here to stand up and think, how does he, this approach, he, because I interpreted it to be he was being very, um, he was going to stick with this idea, I'm going to isolate the variables and see how they individually operate and then I'll bring them together. And he stuck with the idea rather than standing back and saying, well, what's a force and, what if I, and, and maybe I should try a force difference calculation, i.e. shear stress, or what about a stream power? He, he did, I can't find the evidence he thought of doing that or expressed any interest in it. It seemed he really stuck with this idea of let's keep track of the individual variables. And it's impressive to me that, as I showed you, he comes to the conclusion, this didn't work. This is not a generalizable approach. But I learned a lot of stuff, and haven't we all from him? So it's, it's, we, even in our failures to do something, if we report our data well, and we give good descriptions, it still can have an enduring and catalyzing effect for a century. So, but is, I've, I've, uh, maybe Vic has the ability to transport through time and get into someone's mind. I don't know exactly what kept him so absolutely, I'm going to keep it, the, the variables uh, separated and not try to bring them together. I don't know why. So we're going to take this opportunity to ask um, Vic, Alan, and Bob to come up, and Dorothy's going to make a presentation on behalf of the, uh, the, our section. Come on up. Thank you, everybody, for, um, for all the presenters, for my co-chair here, Josh, and for the audience members and your good questions. 
Um, as you've seen very clearly, Gilbert's dependence on field observation and expedition living and his, his adherence to high quality data and the presentation of it has led to a remarkable um, legacy that we're, we could probably continue to talk about for at least another century or more. But interestingly, Bill ended with the ways and means picture of how do you get to the Henry Mountains with Lazarus the mule um, that got um, Gilbert there. And as a fundraiser, EPSP section has created tumblers with Lazarus, that mule on them, saying ways and means, it's figure five from the, the paper, the first edition of it at least. So we're giving each speaker one of those. It's a gift from myself and Josh, and we're giving, I'm actually going to give Josh one as a gift from myself. <laughs> <laughs> and we hope that all of you will go online and purchase these or come to the um, EPSP <coughs> section meeting on, a sharp lecture and business meeting on Thursday at, at four o'clock. And you can also get them there and at the Gilbert Club on Saturday, the Gilbert Club meeting. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.